All right, so I let you guys know that the title of my, well, the title of my sermon this morning is Why We Homeschool. Why We Homeschool. And it may not be for reasons that you think, because different people homeschool for different reasons. I thought I'd read through Deuteronomy 6, because that's where people try and uh, use that scripture to prove that homeschooling is a biblical mandate. I don't, I don't agree with that position, that it's a biblical mandate, but I'll explain to you why, even though it's not a sin to not homeschool, did I use those double negatives right? <laughs> you know what I mean. That there are good reasons to homeschool, uh, and I think it is the wiser choice. Now, first of all, what, what do I mean by homeschooling? Because when, when you say the words homeschooling, People get different pictures in their minds. It's like when you say to somebody, like, you home birth. The picture that it comes into their mind is just like, you just go on it solo, just like no medical treatment, nothing at all, just like no help. No, of course not, right? There's, there's, when you home birth, there's preparation that goes into it. Right? There's preparation, you get an expert, you know, midwife to oversee, you know, they have their oxygen and they have all their, you know, checks and balances that they're doing. And, you know, there are sometimes drugs involved, you know, even in a home birth. So it's, it's not this picture that, you know, it's not these two extremes. That one, there's all this precaution and equipment and the other is just like you're just flying by the seat of your pants. Well, sometimes with homeschool, people get that same picture. They just think homeschool, you're unprepared, you know, you're just flying by the seat of your pants. Now, some people do, it, do do it that way and I don't recommend doing it that way. But then other people, when they think homeschool, they think as well, like, are you bringing what you see at school into the home? And whilst, whilst some people may do that, that's not necessarily homeschooling, where you, you have like just this rigid schedule, you know, you, you do like two hours of class and then 15 minutes of play and then they come back in, you, know, you have a little siren at home, you know, they're out in the backyard and then you hear, ooh, all right, it's time to come back in. You know, so some people, that's what some people think. Some people think when you're homeschooling, it's like that rigid. And that, that's, that's why sometimes they get overwhelmed because they just think, man, like there's all this stuff that goes on at schools. You know, do I have to do that at home? Or they think, you know, some people think homeschooling is just, you know, hiring professionals to come and tutor your children and things like that at your home. And whilst it may involve that, you know, that's not always the case. And even though we call it homeschooling, not all the schooling actually happens at home, <laughs> right? So people get this idea as well that homeschooling is just got your kids wrapped in a bubble, you know, you never let them outside, don't let them see the evil world. And they get that picture with homeschooling. So that's not really the case at all. So what I think of, when I think of homeschooling, it's really not adhering to the practice of dropping your child off to another organization for six hours of the day, five days a week. Because that's what people think of when they think of schooling, whether it's public or private, I mean, that's what you're doing. Basically, you're dropping your kids off for six hours, unless you're there with them. Because right? if you're yeah, there with them, I guess that's, that's a slightly different concept. Like if you're willing to be at the school, be a volunteer teacher and be there, then I'd say that's not so bad. That'd be the equivalent of homeschooling, right? When you take your kids to classes and whatnot. But this idea that you drop your children off for the most attentive, most proactive, most, you know, uh, the, the best part of their day, six hours per day. Because, you know, what time does school start normally? Around nine o'clock? You know, maybe 8.30, it ends at around 2.30, three o'clock. Six hours of the day, five days a week for a large portion of the year. That's what I'm talking about when I think about schooling. And when I think about homeschooling, it's not that practice. It's the fact that you are there with them. You are their primary carer. You are overseeing their teaching rather than outsourcing that to another organization. So some people make the argument from Deuteronomy 6. And this is why, like, I'll explain to you why I, I used, it's funny because I, I used, because when I learned, first learned about homeschooling, and when you first learn about these things, and you hear people's biblical arguments and you say, wow, you know, then it's, it's like biblical. It's like with the whole pants and dresses thing on women. It's like you hear like somebody's preaching and you're just like, man, it's like a sin not to it. And then you, you actually think back and think about what the verse is saying. You've heard counter arguments and you're like, oh man, it's like actually not as clear cut as people make it out to be. But how do people generally argue for 
homeschooling where they say you must homeschool. Like it's a commandment to homeschool and if you do anything else, then you're in sin. Well, generally they go from Deuteronomy 6 and the argument goes something like this. I'll read Deuteronomy 6. You know, Here I is, where the Lord our God is one Lord. And then you've got the first and greatest commandment, which I command these, they shall be in thine heart. These words. And then they go to verse 7. They say, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So a few thoughts there. Where they, where they say homeschool, they say like, see, like thou. Right? So it's singular. It's you must teach your ch children and nobody else. That's why you should homeschool. But the thing is, right, even people that homeschool have group activities where other people might teach their kids. You know, I don't teach my kids soccer. You know, I, I take them to classes. Or if, I, if you want to teach them self-defense or you, you want to give them extra tutoring in different areas, you may hire people to teach them. So this is not a biblical mandate where there's, it's, it's not specifying the method in which you teach your children, right? What, it, what it's talking about is you are primarily responsible for teaching your children, but does that mean nobody else can teach them? Because if you make the case that nobody else is allowed to teach your children, well then what happens when you, you know, take them to sport, you take them here, you take them there, you take them to places where other people are teaching them things, somebody can make the argument, well that's what school is. Right? School is, you know, you, you take them to play soccer and somebody else trains them. Well, I take somebody else to train them maths or train them this. So it's not, the issue is not really that others are teaching them, right? The question is, how much should be, they be teaching them? How long should they be teaching them for? That's why I'm saying the difference between, I see, the main difference between schooling and homeschooling is how much time are you with them? Right? In their, the best part of their day, right? where they're most attentive, they're most receptive, are you going to drop them off for somebody else for the whole period while you go off, both parents go off and work and just leave them with somebody else for six hours a day? Or is it better that you are there seeing what's happening and going on? And we'll talk about some of those benefits as we go through the sermon. So I'm not making the case that school is sinful, but what I hope to show you by the end of this sermon is why I believe homeschooling is the much wiser decision if you want to have the maximum influence in your children's life and the best chance of raising godly children because let's let's face it guys i think about this school school is not just about teaching your children facts and schools admit that you know i work in the education industry and when i see like the school's mottos you know you see the school's mottos it's not just it never just says like you know, teaching them the facts. You know, it's always about striving for excellent character or like, you know, building, you know, the future general, you know, it's, it's always about building character because schools don't, that, why do you think there's all this leftist ideology teaching the kids like how to think and how, how to behave, how to be, you know, courteous and all that because school is not just about reading, writing, and arithmetic. And nowadays, the emphasis is going away from that, right? Where it's not just emphasizing, hey, having good writing skills, having good math skills and comprehension skills. Now it's about training them to think like how they want them to think. And do you really want to give that to another organization? Do you really want to give that to somebody else? You are responsible for raising your children, giving them that character, not somebody else. So you need to make sure it gets done. But if you're never there, how are you going to make sure of that? So you're expected, this is why it's thou, because you're expected to be their primary teacher. It doesn't mean you're their only teacher. That isn't, doesn't mean there are times when you drop them off, right? But do, do you really think it's wise? Like, can you really make the argument that you are the primary influence in their life when for how many hours of the week you know, 30 hours of the week, their best hours of the week that you're not even around. So this is where I'm saying, like, is it really wise to be, to do that? So you're meant to be the primary influence for your children. And why should you be the primary influence for your children, the primary teacher? Because you're the one accountable for them. You know, like if they grow up and they're not how you want them to be, that's your fault. You're responsible because you're accountable for them. How do I know you're accountable for them? Because you have the authority over them. 
Anybody you have authority over, you are accountable for. So I have authority over my family, I'm accountable. Right? Same with my wife. She has authority over the children. She's also accountable for how she raises the children too. Other people don't have authority over my children. The school doesn't have authority over my children unless I grant it to them. So they're not going to be responsible. If they mess up my kids, that's, it's going to end, end up falling on me. Right? Hebrews 13, obey them that have the rule over you. And I know this is in the context of church, but it works the same way with all authorities. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So, that gives you an idea of what I think about the concept of homeschool, what I'm talking about. Now I'm going to give you five reasons why people don't homeschool and hopefully talk you out of them. <laughs> five, reasons why, five reasons that I know of that people don't homeschool and I'll, I'll tell you why I don't think these are good reasons. Number one is, you hear people say, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know. What do you do? <clears throat> now, anything, anything that you don't know how to do seems complicated. You know, like your job that is just like brain dead, mundane. You just like, you know, you could do it sleeping. You know, you go to work and you just like, you can think about other stuff while you're doing it. You know, that probably seems complicated to somebody else. So anything, anything that you don't know, of course, it seems complicated. But then once you know how to do it, you realize it's not that complicated. I remember when Elizabeth like, first started cooking and everything, and then she learned how to make mayonnaise. And it just blew my mind how simple it was. You know, it's literally oil, eggs, some spices, and then you just whip it up, and then you've got homemade mayonnaise. I'm like, I can't believe it's that simple to make. And the ingredients, you know, it's like when you make cookies or whatever. I mean, when you don't know how it's made, you're just like, man, this is just like, it's like magic how people make these things. And once you realize how it's done, you're like, oh, wow, it's, it's actually not that complicated. And it's the same with homeschooling. When you think about homeschooling, a lot of people have different ideas, wrong, wrong perception, wrong ideas, and they just think it's way more complicated than it actually is. They're looking at people that have been doing it for years. They're looking, they're reading on the internet of, of like, you know, people doing blogs and whatnot, and they get a little bit intimidated. But it's not really that hard. I'll just talk you through quickly what it entails in New South Wales. One is the registration. And you're just like, oh, registration, it's literally like a two-page document. And these are not hard questions. This is like, you know, you're filling out your child's name, your address, why you want to homeschool, yeah, that's probably the hardest question on there, and you might put like one or two sentences. And it's a form you scan and then you submit. So the registration is not difficult, right? Second is the curriculum. So the curriculum is just what you're going to teach your kids. Now you don't have to think of all this stuff yourself because you know what, there's companies out there that design curriculums. You know, there's Lymphonics, there's, you know, there's uh, ACE, a lot of people use, there's all sorts of book systems out there, right? Because there's all education companies trying to get your money, you know, lining things up with the curriculum, hoping that you'll use their curriculum to teach your kids, right? And to use those books. So choosing the curriculum is just, you know, looking at the books that, out, that are out there and just choosing which one's good. And if you already know homeschoolers, you can ask them what they're using. And you don't have to choose the right one the first time. You're not going to stuff your kids up if you choose the wrong curriculum the first time. You know what happens? You choose one curriculum, you go with it, you realize what you like and you don't like, and the next year you change it. You say, you know, I like this one better, or I like that one better. You, you learn as you go, just like at your job. You know, you do it first. It seems complicated the first year, like with your kids, the first one's hardest, and the second one's easy. So same with homeschooling. As you get more, you become more familiar with it, with what you're trying to to do. These are just the, the organizational aspects. The th third one is you have to measure the progress. Measure the progress of your kids. And you're thinking like, Man, how am I meant to know what to measure? Well, you don't need to know. Why? Because the government's already determined what you, what you need to measure, right? Because on the Bosties website, they tell you, hey, these are all the things you've got to measure and everything. So all you've got to do is just put that into a table and then just, you know, check your kid. Okay, how did they do against that one? How did they do against that one? Just go down the list and just put your own judgment how, that, how they're going, right? So it's, this is not something you have to really 
figure out, these are things that are already, obviously you have to learn what I'm teaching you now, but one, that's what I'm saying, once you figure it out, it's not really that complicated. And I speak from, like, from personal experience, even when, like, when we first started thinking about homeschooling, and I remember like talking to Kev about it and saying, what is, and then I realized when we actually went through the process, it's like, man, it's actually, it's actually not that complicated at all. You know, I don't know. I honestly, I honestly don't even know why um, like New South Wales homeschooling moms are even complaining about all the, <laughs> the admin because it's, it's not really that much if you think about it, right? There are some things. So you got measuring the progress. Fourth one is the location, where you're going to teach them. And that's as simple as, you know, a dining table, the kitchen table, you know, because they're just looking that you have somewhere to, to teach your kids. Obviously, if they come to your house and your house is a mess and everything like that, then, you know, you've got, you got bigger problems, you know. So, that's the location. The next one is, you know, obviously take, take photos of activities that your kids do because they want to see that there's some social activity and things like that. And that can just be like church, sports clubs, you know, activity clubs. Just take some photos. If you take some photos and just keep some photos. So all these things, so registration, you register, you've got your curriculum, you're measuring your progress, you've got the location where you're going to teach them, you've got photos, you know, you've got activities that you're bringing them to. And like I said, that's just church, sports and whatnot. That's what they're looking for when they come for the inspection. So it's not as Orwellian or as authoritarian as you think it is. You know, some people think, oh, you know, is the inspector coming and they're going to dictate everything you do and tell you what you need to teach and whatnot. No, because, you know, because they've got a job to do. Generally, the inspector comes. You know, Elizabeth even says that sometimes they come, she's like prepared stuff, they just flick through it. Because what they're just trying to see is that you've actually got some things planned. You know, so you, you have a way to measure them. You've got a curriculum chosen. You've got a place where you're going to teach them. You know, they're just seeing whether your place is, is not neglected, you know, because really in Australia, they're just looking for, they don't want kids to be neglected at the end of the day. They just don't want children to be neglected because a lot of times parents don't send their kids to school or they register for homeschooling because they just don't really want to do much at all. And it's just easier to just have their kids hang around at home and that's, you know, obviously not a good thing. So I think it's good that they are, you know, checking out people to make sure at least keeping parents accountable. So, it's not as complicated as you think. And if you don't know how, it's just something that you have to learn. I mean, look what the Bible says in Proverbs 1. It says, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. And like I said, you know, don't be intimidated by other homeschooling parents that have been doing it for a lot longer. Don't be intimidated by the homeschooling blog, right? You know, you go out online and you see the homeschooling blog and you're just thinking like, man, these parents are like super parents. No, because that's, it's, that's so, it's like social media, guys. When, when, you, when, you, when you start a homeschooling blog, you think they're blogging about all their failures and all the, all the, all the dead time, the idle time, the time they didn't know. No, no, when, they, when they're starting, well, it's a marketing thing. Generally, a, a woman starts a homeschooling blog because they're trying to get people interested, you know, write engaging articles, get the clicks on the ads and everything, be an affiliate mark. It's a marketing thing, right? So yeah, it can provide some good information, but don't get this idea, just like when you look at somebody's Facebook feed, that that's just, you know, as spectacular. I mean, the, the reality of day-to-day -day homeschooling is not as spectacular as those blogs make it out to be. And, you know, more often than not, the, the blogs of homeschoolers are done by exceptional women. Why? Because the, the fact that they have the time to even figure out something additional to teaching and feeding and taking care of their own children. So you're, you're already skewed when you're looking online, reading from homeschooling mums. These are already the, the mums that are above the rest, but you don't need to be them to be a homeschooler. You know, so just, just think about that. You know, probably the majority of your homeschooling mums don't have time for that, right? Because they are focused on actually taking care of their children and things like that. And you know what? Even saying that, I'm sure if Elizabeth posted photos and things every now and then of the things she did at home, you probably think she was a superstar homeschooling mom. Because that's just what that feed does, right? Because you selectively choose what you want to show people. So you're just scrolling through somebody's feed, you're just thinking like, man, look at this family doing all these activities, children are so happy. Yeah, it's because they're not posting all the photos where the children are crying and they're struggling and things like that. So there's, there's the reality of it 
and then there's the online perception of it, right? Now, another thing is, if you don't know, homeschooling actually forces you to be part of their learning. So you, not only you know, are, are they learning, but you're also learning at the same time, right? So you increasing in learning is not just learning how to homeschool, but what is actually being taught. Teaching yourself again the things that are being taught. And even Elizabeth, as she teaches the kids, she's learning a lot of things as well. Sometimes Simon is teaching her things. Because <laughs> Simon will learn something, and then, you know, rather than explaining it to a teacher, you get to learn now the things that they learn, and they explain it to you, as opposed to somebody else. But not only the academics of teaching your children now that you teach your children you've learned something with them now you've got more things in common so it's easier to build that relationship with your children because how do you build relationships as well you have experiences that you share that are in common so you learn things together that's just another thing between you and your children so not only that relationship but you, you learn as well about handling different children as well. You learn how to handle different personalities amongst your children. So you're going to grow yourself from that personally. Learning from different characters, also learning about yourself in terms of your strengths and your own weaknesses. So I know that was some feedback Elizabeth gave me about, you know, as she's going through this process, she's learning more about herself, what pushes her over the edge, you know, what she's strong in, what she's weak in, and then she knows where she can work on things in her own life. So what they learn is not really that complicated, especially if you're starting from a young age. Obviously, if you're pulling your kids out from an old, older age, that's going to be a bit more complex what they are learning. But when you're starting out as a new parent, homeschooling, I mean, what they are learning at the beginning, when you go and see what is actually required of a year one, a year two, a year three student, it's actually very, very basic in terms of the concepts that you're teaching them. What is difficult is the patience that you have with them. That, that's what's difficult about homeschooling. It's not, if you're thinking, if you're intimidated by the facts and the figures, that's, not, that's, that's, that's nothing to be intimidated about. What, what you may not be prepared for is the patience it requires to teach children. But then that's no different to actually being a parent, right? The same patience that it requires to be a parent, you know, and, and uh, you know, the, the way you conduct yourself and how you explain things is no different when you're just teaching them things to do with life. Because really, you should be doing it anyway. Like when it comes to training your children, I mean, you're not just leaving your children to fend for themselves. You should be teaching them and instructing them just in life anyway. The only difference is now, now you're actually teaching them skills. You know, reading, writing, organization, whatnot. Um, facts and figures about the world, <coughs> teaching them to read. So that's what's more difficult. So like I said, knowledge is not an e a reason why people shouldn't homeschool. Number two is, and you'll hear, this, you'll hear this a lot, that's why I put this as one as number two, like if you homeschool, won't your kids be antisocial? Now, <laughs> if you think about it, with, with the sort of kids that are in school, sometimes this is actually a reason to homeschool. That you don't want them socializing with those kids at school. That's why this is like a, a double-edged sword in the sense, yeah, you want your children to be able to interact with other children, but that doesn't mean you just want them interacting with any children. You know, because if they interact with the bad children, those are the children you don't want them to interact with. So when you homeschool, you have some control over who they interact with because you can choose to pull them out of a class. And you know, at home, obviously, you can set the environment, but when you send them off to an organization for six hours a day, I mean, you're really taking a gamble on the children that they hang out with when, when, and when you're not even there. You don't even know the sort of children that you hang out with. I mean, is a teacher gonna be able to tell every parent like, which kid, you know what I mean? Like, that's where you are responsible for those kids to make sure that they are hanging around the right people. Look what Proverbs 13 says. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. We have to be very careful who our children hang around. So yes, this is one reason why we homeschool is because we want to control who they socialize with, but that doesn't mean they don't have any social activity at all. And that's something that we have to make sure of. And it's not that difficult, you know, in the sense of bringing them to church, having activities for them. That's why the church activities are important too, to have the kids 
interacting with one another. So they need some interaction, but we definitely need to control who they are interacting with. You know, some people will say things like, oh yeah, but if I send my children to school, they're going to be a light in that place. And you, really guys, I mean, what, how bright do you think the light is of a child? When you've still got to teach them things, you've got to teach them, you've got to give that, got to bring that light into them. And especially at a young age, you may not even be saved yet. You've got to send them into, into the world, into the darkness. I mean, how are you going to protect them from the darkness that is coming from the children of unbelievers? I mean, that's what's harder. I mean, is it, hard, is it harder to raise a children up, child up to be godly, or is it easier to make them sinful? And yet you're going to send them off to an organization with who knows who, with who knows whose children. I mean, what are they going to be learning? How are you going to protect them? I mean, for those of us who got caught up in pornography, how many of us were introduced to it from a friend? What about you know, alcohol, drugs, smoking? How many of us were introduced to that from a friend? Yeah. Right? So you've got to think about, don't underestimate the power of peer pressure. Don't think just because, you know, even you may be a spiritual person and you just think, oh yeah, what people say don't bother me. Don't underestimate that with kids. You know, you, you think Simon's a, a confident kid, but when he's around kids that are more confident than him, he shrinks, you know what I mean? And I've, so we see it. We see it, like even amongst his soccer peers. That's why, like, yeah, it, yeah, he plays soccer, but it's a limited time. Now, if he was spending six hours, five days a week with these kids, I'd be worried. You know, there, there are kids in his soccer team, even when they were six, seven years old, already using swearing words. You know, a bad attitude, disrespecting authority. You want that sort of attitude rubbing off on your kids? So sometimes it's good. What, what about bullying? You know, don't underestimate the power of bullying. You think every child has the confidence at a young age to stand up to a bully? You know, like I said, that's why like, I learn things from my kids because, you know, you think even Simon, right? Confident kid. But then, like I said, I've seen situations where there are kids more confident than him telling him off and he shies down. And you just think, man, what happened to that confident Simon? Well, it's because... Kids aren't as strong as you think when they're going up against bullies, bad influences. What about molestation? Sometimes molestation happens just from older kids. You think it's always adults just taking kids into a room? No, sometimes it's the older kids at school taking the younger kids away and molesting them, right? Doing things that they know are wrong with naive kids that have no idea what's going on. So... Who, who's, who's there protecting them? You think that handful of teachers, you know, that are busy? I mean, you guys remember when you went to school, right? Yep. There's, one, there's one teacher supervising the whole playground. And you could go anywhere, here, there. I mean, think about the experiences, even if you didn't turn out that bad. Just think about the experiences you went through in primary school, in high school, the sort of things you saw, the people you knew. Man, if you got through that, you're like lucky to get through that unscathed. Or some of the things you see, most of us didn't get through unscathed. You know, a lot of things were shared with us that we shouldn't have seen, we shouldn't have done. And that's why it really, it really, it really boggles my mind when people say things like, you know, I went to public school and I turned out fine. And you're like, oh really? I, I, didn't, I didn't know that you, you know, you putting church first all the time in your life, soul winning first. I didn't know Jesus was the center of your life when you were growing up, you know, correct doctrine. Yeah, because people when they think they turn out, yeah, okay, you didn't turn out to be a rapist or a murderer. I mean, is your standard like just one millimeter off the floor? You know, like I want my standard to be higher. So what I think say, my kids didn't turn out that bad. I want them as close to godliness as possible. Not just that they didn't become a rapist. You know, not just that they are, oh, they, they got a career, they're successful, but where are they in church? Do they even read the Bible? Do they even talk about the Bible? Do they even care how they're going to raise their kids? No, that's why it's, it's so much more important that it's not just they turned out all right. How many friends do, do children really need? I don't know if you think about it, I mean, how many friends are you still friends with? How many friends, are, even though there were so many kids at school, I mean, how many friends, you know, when you think about when you went to high school or primary school, I mean, how many friends were you really friends with? 
even though other kids were there. I mean, I remember 30 kids in the class, but I could count my close friends on one hand, the ones I actually played with every day at school and you know, went to their houses and mucked around with. So it's not like there's that many kids. And when people send their child just into a bunch of kids and just say, well, they're going to learn how to socialize. <laughs> is that... I just, is that how kids learn to socialize? I thought they learned to socialize because we train them. We teach them how to behave. We teach them how to interact. When you send a kid just into a random group of kids, it's just survival of the fittest. Yes. And, and you're just hoping that, you know, the only reason why there are well-behaved kids in that group is because they had parents that taught them how to behave. And you're just lucky, you know, putting them in that group and you just happen to have a group of kids that were well-behaved. But you know what? If it's the opposite, if there's a group of kids that don't know how to behave, man, it's just survival of the fittest. And that's why the bullies, the confident kids, just like, it's just amazing that kids look up to bullies. You know what I mean? Like the confident kids, the, the kids that are more talented, kids just naturally look up to those kids even though they're being bullied by them. And it's just amazing. And you need to be there to see it, to, to, to wake your kids up to it because when you see it i mean it's, it's your responsibility to expose that to them and say look hey don't let that kid talk to you that way don't think like that and you know kids sometimes kids sometimes can't articulate what they're feeling yeah. they can't articulate like something's happened to them and they don't know why they're feeling they don't, they don't make the connection that something that's happening to them is making them feel a certain way but if you see it if you're there and you're like you can help expose it to them and say, hey, is it because of this? Are you thinking this? But when you're not there, how, how are you going to help them? You know, when you realize they're depressed and they're down and you have no idea why it is. Is it because it's a bully? Is it because somebody said something? You, you know? So that's just some things that I see in my, my own life. And you, like I said, you know, when you have to teach them character, I mean, what are your odds? sending your kid, especially to a public school in 2019, what are, your, what are the odds of your child picking up good behaviors from the other children at school? And you know this idea of uh, you know, people being socialized and they're social, sometimes it just comes down to the character of the child. I have a nephew and you know, my, my sister is not a believer or anything, but I, her child, I mean, if you think she's an only child, and well-off parents, I mean, if, if you think of a child that goes to activities, this kid goes to activities. Like, he's, he's in everything, right? Because my, my sister has time to take him everywhere. Take him to this, everything. But he still just says <laughs> he's social. Comes to my house and he just want to play in the corner. And so it just goes to show, you know, some, it, it's, it's not a do or die. It's not just because you put them with kids, they're going to be social. You don't put them with kids, they're going to be antisocial. You know, kids have their own character as well. And it can be molded. You know, to me, this is just like a, it's a, it's a sort of a straw man, right? That it's, they're going to be antisocial because it's, it, 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 really, there's more, like I said, there's more of a risk putting them in that situation than taking them out of it. Number three, some people will say it's too expensive to homeschool. Too expensive to homeschool. Well, ask yourself this question, how much are your children worth to you? Too expensive to homeschool. Well, what's at stake? How much are they worth to you? You know, we talk about, you know, if you lost the life of a child, I mean, how much would you be willing to spend? I mean, I'm sure if parents with older kids, teenagers that turned out bad, how much money do you think they'd be willing to spend to reverse that? If, you know, if they could just pay a certain amount and change the character of their now you know teen or adult that's gone astray man i don't think any amount of money would somebody would be willing to give all they have to just you know have their child live right jesus says here well what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul how much is it worth to you if you lose the soul of one of your children is it worth it you know, do you really want to roll the dice with your children at a public school? Like I said, you spend six hours, they spend six hours a day with probably unbelievers and their children. And like I said, how much would you pay 
to reverse that in the future. But is it actually cheaper? I would pose the question, is, is homeschooling actually more expensive than public schooling or private schooling? Um, you know, I tried to find out how much public schooling costs here. I'm not sure. I mean, different schools pay different fees, I'm sure. I don't know how much people spend overall when they send their kid to a public school. I googled it and this is the first article that came up. <laughs> public schools should be free. I obviously don't agree with this. This is parents complaining. Why? Because they obviously feel like they're paying too much. I, always, I, always thought, I already thought it was free, but obviously not. Public schools should be free. Parent outrage at invoices for voluntary fees. And you can't see this high up, but it says here, ca cash-strapped schools are sending parents invoices for voluntary contributions in a practice that the peak parent body says is exploiting vulnerable families who feel pressured to pay optional fees of more than $2,000 at some New South Wales public schools. So when you think about school, I mean, you know, when you pay for school, generally you're paying for the activities, out, extracurricular activities and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of it's paid by the voluntary contributions that you have to give to the school. You know, you want them to go on that camp or that outing, you've got to pay for it. You pay for it on top of it. So what is the school paying for? I mean, just the, they're paying for the building, obviously, the classroom and the supplies and all that. You may get some stationery and whatnot. But you know what, guys? You already got a house. So you're not paying extra for that. And supplies are so cheap. You know, and it comes to pencils and pens and textures and scrapbooks and, you know, even the, even the curriculum books are cheap in the scheme. I mean, one curriculum book might set you back $10, $15, and one of those books is like the activities for the whole year. So you buy like one Lemphonics book, for example, and they do one page a day, and that one book is like their year one book. So it's like, it's, it's not expensive. The resources, so I don't, I don't know, all the different fees of public schools, but if you're going to send your kid to a school, are you really going to send them to a public school? Chances are you're going to send them to a private school, right? Because you're going to say, like, man, I'm not going to send my kids to a public school, you know, with all the just ra random kids. I'm going to send them to a good Christian public school. Well, therefore, I mean, is that going to be cheaper? No way. I mean, I looked up, this is Regent's Park Christian School, and look at their fees. It's like fees, this is enrollment fees, so you have to pay like 60 bucks application fee, what was it 30 bucks, 15 bucks, 600 dollars bond, so you probably get that back later. Here's the annual fee for K to 6, 4,180. Now obviously if you divide that over the year, that's not a ton of money. But you know, you know how much I've spent? Because I, I keep track of my expenses, I keep track of what I spend on homeschooling when I buy supplies. I even include like activities, whenever it's like active, like they went to the wildlife park, I put that under homeschooling. My kids go to soccer, their lessons goes to homeschooling, right? Because I treat that as part of their phys ed and whatnot. In the last financial year, I've spent $2,000. And if you come to my house and you see like the room that my wife has set up for school, you know, all the books, all the, all the art and craft materials, I mean, you wouldn't think that my children are neglected. They've got all sorts of stuff to play with and all sorts of stuff to read and whatnot. And she's always buying one. That's why it's like, you know, home, homeschooling can be expensive, but it can also be cheap. <laughs> it's just like, it just depends how you spend your money. It's like clothing your children. It can be expensive, but it can also be cheap, right? Because it just depends, like, how wisely you spend the money that you have. And if you're wise about what you buy, yeah, if you just buy every trendy thing that comes out and all the steam and latest steam tech and everything like that, yeah, obviously it's gonna get expensive. But if you're creative in how you teach your children, how you give them experiences, you take advantage of specials, sometimes taking them out is cheaper because you can go off season, right? So if you take advantage of those things, it's a lot cheaper. And look at this $4,000 from Regents Park Christian School. Look what it says here. So it tells you what it includes, compulsory, compulsory school excursions, activities, camps, and whatnot, and subject supplies. Excluded from tuition fees. ICT device lease fees. What is that? That's like all your tech. Because now you, you know, you're required to buy a laptop, you know, all the software and licensing and stuff like that. You may use that at home. Well, that's not included in the $4,000, so you're going to have to pay that on top. 
uh, uniforms, fundraising activities, there's all this other representative sport activities. So that $4,000 doesn't include playing soccer and all that sort of stuff. Optional camps, other stuff. So there are a lot of things that aren't included in this that you're paying on top. So to think that homeschooling is uh, more expensive, I don't think so, because a lot of the things that you're doing outside of school are not actually paid for by the school. And a lot of things that are paid for by the school, you know, which is the facilities there, you may not actually need because you know, you've got a house, you've got all the stuff uh, that you need to teach them. So it just depends how you spend your money. You can do it expensive and you can do it cheap. All right, two more. Number four is, I'm not better than a professional. I mean, I heard parents say that, saying like, oh, I, can't, I can't homeschool because I'm not going to be better than the paid professional that's got qualifications and they went to, to uni and studied how to teach somebody for three years. Let me ask you this. Like, do you think there's no such thing as a bad teacher? Like, do you think just because all these kids turn out of university and TAFE or whatever and they get a teaching degree that all the teachers are good just because they've got that qualification? I mean, what percentage of teachers do you think are good compared to teachers that you think are bad? And really, when you send your kid to the public school where you don't even get a choice where you're sending them, I mean, how do you know you're going to get a good teacher? How do you know when you send them to a school that has a reputation for good teachers that the one teaching your child is going to be the good one in the school? So you take a bit of a gamble because you don't really, I mean, you can control it to a sense because you could figure out who the teacher is, send them. So you can get luck. I'm not, I'm, sorry, I'm saying it's, this is going to be the exceptional case where you find somebody that you agree with what you want to teach your child. They're going to do it the way you want to do it, in the environment you want to do it, and then you're satisfied to leave that, your child with that person. But we don't want to underestimate the influence from teachers as well. Remember, like when we talked about influence from other children, I mean, what is the influence that the, the teacher is going to have on your child? When the teacher teaches, is Jesus at the centre of what they teach? Because you can make sure of that. You can make sure that when you teach your children, you can always refer it back to God, refer it back to Jesus. Explain why Jesus did things the way he did. You don't always have to make it secular, otherwise you might lose your job. Is the right doctrine believed? Is the view of the Bible solid? And if you need to review and unlearn things, I mean, you might as well just teach them anyway. It's funny when I talk to people that send their kids to school and you just think, well... You know, it's, it's easier or whatnot, but then they end up having to like do a lot of home stuff as well. Like, there's a lot of stuff that they have to do anyway. So, uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting ahead of myself because that's the last point. But, I'm not better. Some people think that. What about this? I mean, do you really think a teacher with 20 to 30 students that they have to look after is going to be better than a teacher that just has a couple of students to teach at home that are at different stages? You know, as well, because when you teach your kid, they're at different stages. They're what, you know, when you teach your youngers, they're going to be more advanced. So there are going to be kids that require less supervision. But if you have a class of 36-year-olds, 37-year-olds, where they all require the equal amount of attention, I mean, is it easier for you to handle a few kids and give them the attention they need rather than a teacher? You know, you always hear about it now, right? Teachers are overburdened, underpaid. They've got bigger, class, bigger classrooms. I mean, are you going to do... I, don't you have a better chance of doing a better job than the teacher that is already like stretched amongst so many kids? So there's that. But then there's also the lack of discipline. Because you know what? Children need to be taught nurture, taught facts and figures, taught character. But you, you know what they also need? They need discipline. And sometimes they need a spanking during that six hours of the day. But if you send them off to school, they're not going to spank them. I mean, it's illegal to spank them here. No teacher's going to risk their job spanking kids, doing it biblically. It's just not going to happen. So this is where homeschooling has the advantage that sending them off to an organization will never have. Right? Well, you are there. You see them. And it ha you're going to correct them at the time it happens as well. Not six hours. I mean, how much, how much are your kids getting away with? How much poor behavior are they getting away with when you're only correcting them at home? 
for about six hours. You don't know what they've been saying, what they've been doing to other kids. They come home, they could know how to pretend. You don't think Simon would know how to pretend like to be an angel? Okay, oh well, yeah. How was your day, Simon? Oh, it was great, great. great. Even at his age, I'm sure he would be able to give that sort of account of his day, right? It just, it, it, you know, conveniently forget all the times that he got in trouble. But when you homeschool, no, no, you're there. You can see it. So don't think you can't do it. You want to have the attitude like in Philippians 4. You know, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And it, like I said, it's not as complicated as you think. And you know what? You will. You have the edge on even the most qualified teacher. Why? Because you are the parent. You can spank. You love them more. And you have less children to teach. So when people think, I'm not going to do a better job, you know, it's, that's like starting a race and you're already like 80 metres ahead of a 100 metre race. You're already ahead of the teacher that has to catch up with all those things. So yeah, are there some teachers that can do better than some people? Yeah, of course. But you can. You can strive to do it. If you're a capable person, if you're not disabled or have any learning issues and things like that, there's no reason why. I mean, those are the exceptions. But for those of us who are able-bodied, have our mind there, there's no reason why I think you can't do a better job than even the best of teachers out there. The last reason people don't homeschool is the worst reason. It's obviously laziness. Because, yeah, yeah is, is it easier to ship your kids off? Is it easier to outsource parenting? Of course. Get somebody else to do it, funded by the government. Of course it's easier, but is it better? You know, this is obviously a bad reason why people do it. But then I would argue, is it, is it really easier? <laughs> is, it, is it easier to, to, you know, get all your kids in the car, drop them in the school, drop, pick them up afterwards? You know, then you want to work, now you want to work your part-time job, right? And then you got to go to work and then kids get sick and you're like, oh, I've got to go back. And yeah. is, it, is it really easier? Like, I, I think it's easy to be at home and then not have to take them here not every day in the morning and pack their lunch and get them ready, this and that. You know, participate in all the activities that the school requires you to do and then you, you, know, you can run the schedule as you see fit. It works with your lifestyle. Sometimes it's easier when you get sick, when you give birth. Homeschool, you can take a break. You don't have to line up your holidays with school. You don't have to line up your terms with school. You can just go at your own pace. So... Is it really easier? Even when you send them to school, I mean, you still have to, like I said, review schoolwork, review homework. You know, it's not like when you send them to school, I mean, if you have the attitude of sending them to school and you have to do nothing at home, you're being a bad parent. Because even if you send them to school, to an organization, when they come home, I mean, you, you still gotta be a parent. You can't outsource parenting. You still have to be a parent. You just have to know like, what they're learning and everything like that. So if you're doing it all anyway, you probably will do a better job just teaching them yourself and then you can outsource particular subjects. See, that's where I think it's the difference. You know, like I outsource sport. And I outsource, so, you know, later on in life, I might outsource other things depending on what they want to pursue. You know, they wanted to pursue a certain career. That's obviously when you start getting specialized in different fields or they want to take on maths when they're like 10, 10, 11, get a tutor and things like that. You know, after you pay the tutor, you're probably paying the same amount of fees and now it's focused. You know, you're not paying the fees and then getting them to learn that they're not a boy when they've got a, you know, a, a male organ or they're not a woman when they've got a female organ and all that other garbage that comes along with what they teach at schools. <coughs> So you can't outsource parenting. Laziness is never a good reason, right? Proverbs 20, the sluggard would not plow by reason of the cold, therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. And what I think about this with parenting, when I, when I, when I read this verse and sort of apply it to parenting, I think of like the parent that's like begging their child, don't do this, why did you turn out like this? Well, you know, the sluggard won't plow by reason of the cold. He's going to beg in time of harvest. What sort of people will they become? Genesis 26, look at this. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Berai the Hittite. Now, should he have done that? And he's taken a second wife and Bathsheba, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Look at this, which were a grief of mine. 
unto Isaac and Rebekah. So what sort of people are they becoming? See, it's not, what's important about teaching our kids is not the facts and the figures. I mean, how much do you even remember from chemistry? It's like that joke. When was the last time you said Bunsen burner? Yeah, year 10, chemistry, year 11, chemistry. Since then, it's like, what's a Bunsen burner? What do I need a Bunsen burner for? So how much did you learn? I mean, that's why. It's the, the, what's important about raising children is not that they, you know, the facts and the figures, it's the character. You know, that's why you can learn the facts and the figures. It's like even in our own life. Wisdom, Elizabeth and I were just talking about this last night, and I was just reflecting on, you know, when people excel at life, the people that are like the elites of the elites in any, any area of discipline, business, sport, whatever, it, it's always intelligence that differentiates them. Why? Because there's a certain level of skill where you have equal skill. Think about, I, I think about it in soccer, right? All those players on the field are like exceptional ball handling, touch. You know, they know how to probably catch the ball, dribble properly. And, but you know the difference, what differentiates them? It's, it's what's in here. So it's the same with our kids. It's, I feel like, you know, you can teach people facts, you can teach people figures, but then character like, can take a lifetime to build, like the intelligence, the mind. That's what you want to affect. Now, I'll end on this point, because I talked about five reasons why people don't homeschool. <coughs> Hopefully showed you why I don't think they are the best reasons, you know, and I think it's wiser that we take responsibility for our children, that we control the schedule rather than just outsourcing five days a week, six hours a day. The, the, like I said, let this sink in, the best time of the day. Right? Because that's when they're most attentive, most receptive, when they wake up, you know, where you can influence them the most. You think they come back from school after six hours of school, they're tired. What usually happens? They do some after school activity, come home, you're preparing dinner, you get them to bed, and then you do it all over again for five days. So you're giving that time away, that, that, that where you can be, you can instill the best into them and hoping that that organization will do a better job. Now we need to take some responsibility for that. So five reasons why people don't homeschool. But I want to, the last point I want to share with you is the unrivaled reason why you should homeschool and where you cannot accomplish this with sending your kids to a schooling organization. And that's time. The time spent with your children. Now when you have children, you think time goes really slow and you're just thinking like, this kid will never learn this. They'll never get off the breast. They'll never I've carry them forever. They'll never learn how to read. They'll never learn how to do this or do that. And then before you know it, they're adults. <laughs> All right? That's how it is. That's why life is short, guys. James 4.14, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. How much shorter is the youth of a child? This is talking about your whole life. The time you have to affect your children's character is such a short window. Do you really want to give that to somebody else? But not only that. You know, not only does time go so quick, but you have like, you know, you have more one-on-one -on -one time. You know, more shared experiences. The things that they do. The things that they make. Right? You're there, seeing it. They're showing you. You get to take them. You get to see their reaction when they look at animals and whatnot. You know, let me ask you guys, do you really want to give that experience to somebody else? Do you know what I mean? Like, you look back at your photos and you just think like, oh man, what a precious moment. Exactly. And you got it. Yes. But you want to give that to somebody else? Somebody you don't even know? that's going to enjoy all those first moments from your kid, man, you're giving away something really precious. And that's why I think that's something you can't get when you send your kid to school. 
And one day you'll look back at these moments and you'll, like, you'll regret that you weren't there yeah. when you give it away. So, you know, you've got you to cherish the moments because kids grow up so quick. Amen. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Thank you for the children that you've given us. I just pray, Lord, I know not everyone has children and not everyone's able to have children, but Lord, help us to value that the children that we have. Lord, time goes so quick. Life goes so quick. And Lord, I just pray that you know, we would make the right choice to not only try and educate our children, but enjoy the moments that we have with them, not to give them to somebody else, Lord. So we thank you. Pray that you give us wisdom and grace, Lord. We need patience. We need help to raise our children how we ought. So we just pray for that wisdom. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.